here they come, our astronauts, led by Commander Mark Polanski, Pilot William Ophelein, Nicholas Patrick, Robert Kerbeam, Krista Fugelsang, Joan Higginbotham, and Sonny Williams. Three, two, one. We have booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery lighting up the night sky as we continue building the International Space Station. Good afternoon. What you just witnessed was 13 incredible, exhilarating, absolutely magical days I spent quite literally out of this world, <laughs> crammed into two minutes. But what you just saw is what most people get to see, and that's the glamorous space flight. But inquiring minds may want to know what happens before the glamorous space flight because I can attest that one doesn't get to be an astronaut one day and fly in space the next. Many of my colleagues could tell you precisely where they were the first time man stepped foot on the moon and what a profound effect it had on their lives. I, on the other hand, can't tell you where I was. I was five. I was probably taking a nap. <laughs> Is that wrong? <laughs> Despite that dubious beginning, I managed to find my way to NASA, or more accurately, NASA managed to find its way to me. You see, it was my last year of university, and graduation was rapidly approaching, and my main goal, besides not moving back home with mommy and daddy, love you both, <laughs> was to work for IBM. I mean, we had history. I had interned with IBM for two summers during my college career, and I thought it was the perfect fit for my newly honed electrical engineering skills. Apparently, we were on different pages. They were not hiring engineers at the time, but they graciously offered to bring me on board as a sales rep, which was not my first choice of careers, or second, or third. Unbeknownst to me, though, my resume, along with some of the other graduating senior engineers, were sent to NASA at the Kennedy Space Center. And out of the blue, pun intended, a man named Jose called me and said, are you interested in moving to Florida to launch space shuttles? Now, is that a dream come true or what? <laughs> For me, it was, or what? Because a year earlier, Space Shuttle Columbia had disintegrated two and a half minutes into its flight. So in my mind, this is really a career-limiting move. <laughs> and besides, I wasn't interested in NASA whatsoever, not at all. But to Jose's credit, he kind of sensed my hesitation and said, hey, why don't you uh, come on down to Florida and take a look around and, and we can interview you. 
Now, as the saying goes, mama didn't raise no fool. I was a poor college student, and there I was about to get an all-expense-paid trip to Florida, and I was going to take it. <laughs> so one damp, dreary, foggy morning in Chicago, I, I boarded a plane, and two and a half hours later, I landed in Florida, the Sunshine State. Palm trees are blowing in the breeze. So far, so good. I get over to the Kennedy Space Center, and they take me in the processing facility where they're getting a shuttle ready for launch. And the first thing that popped into my mind was, why doesn't this blow up more often? I mean, there were miles of wiring, there were hundreds of switches in the cockpit, and the thousands of tiles that encompass the space shuttle were so light and fragile that you could actually scratch and dent them with your fingernail. But they are able to withstand thousands of degrees of heat as the shuttle re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. We left the garage where they were prepping the shuttle and we made the three mile journey out to the launch pad. As we were getting closer, you can just see the launch pads just looming over the horizon. And there it was at the base of the platform where men and women had been hurtled into space for decades. It was something straight out of Star Wars. And I thought, I'm moving to Florida <laughs> to launch space shuttles, at least for five years, and then I'd, I'd reassess my career. Well. Back home, you can imagine that my parents were just as proud as they can be. They were just beaming with pride, literally incandescent. My grandmother, who was a very firm believer that the whole NASA thing was a hoax, <laughs> she was telling everybody her granddaughter was going to go work for NASA. It's like, it's NASA, Granny. I mean, I legitimized the whole operation for her. And I'm sure had NASA known that, they would have hired me much sooner. A few months later, my sister and I get in the car. We make the 1,200-mile journey from Chicago to Florida. Unbald tires, as it turned out, we didn't know. With all my worldly possessions and my little Chevy Citation. I really didn't own much at that time. There I was, a fresh out, ready to start my first day at the Kennedy Space Center. That's what they used to call us, fresh outs, because we were fresh out of college, and we didn't know anything. That first year whizzed by as I got acclimated to my job and my new state of Florida as my home base. And a few months later, it was time to launch the very first shuttle after that tragic accident, STS-126. Everybody on the Space Center was just really excited. They were a little nervous too, because our livelihoods, as well as the future of the Space Shuttle program, was literally riding on the successful launch and landing of the Space Shuttle. My lovely desk at the time was in a government trailer about three miles from the launch pad, and that's the closest anybody could be to the launch pad when we were launching a shuttle. So I ran out on the front porch of the trailer, and as the countdown clock began, it got down to T minus zero, and I just saw the shuttle leap off of the pad. And I was excited, and I felt so patriotic because I had worked on that shuttle, even though it was only for about a half an hour. So we started to launch shuttles more frequently, and about seven years into my five-year career, I was like, oh, I forgot my five-year assessment there. <laughs> but life was good. I would gotten a couple of promotions, seen many shuttle launches, working on them, until, until one day my boss uttered five little words that would change the fabric of my life forever. He said, you'd make a great astronaut. You'd make a great astronaut. And I smiled appreciatively, and I went about my business. <laughs> and I thought, who is he kidding? Like a five foot three inch African American female electrical engineer that landed at NASA by some twist of fate is going to be selected to be an astronaut. I was flattered, but I figured I had a snowball's chance. A few months later, he asked me if I put in my application, and I said no, and he kind of shot me one of those looks, so I put in my application. Along with 6,000 of my closest friends. <laughs> of the 6,000 people who had put in applications, 120 of us were lucky enough to get interviews. And I use the term interview loosely because of that entire week that we were at the Johnson Space Center. Most of that time was spent going psych under, undergoing physical and psychological exams. And only one hour of the entire week 
was allotted for us to sit down in front of the astronaut selection board and plead our case. The one thing I knew after that week was over was that I was not going to die anytime soon because those, thorough, those exams, shall we say, were incredibly thorough. <laughs> Six long, grueling months of waiting while they delved into our medical backgrounds and actually had the FBI investigate us to make sure that we were good American citizens, we all got a phone call, all 120 of us. My phone call went something like this. Joni, we had so many good candidates. I had not been selected. So if you really do the math, the chances of being one of the 120 people selected from the 6,000 to interview was 2%. But if you were lucky enough to be one of those 120 people, the chances of you being one of the 15 people that were finally selected to be an astronaut went up to a whopping 12%. So despite those odds, I was hurt, I was disappointed, and quite frankly, I was embarrassed. Nobody from the Kennedy Space Center had ever been selected to be an astronaut, and the entire center was rooting for me, and I felt as though I had let them down. And what I really didn't know until the day after the phone call was that I wasn't the only one from the Kennedy Space Center who had been interviewed. There was someone else who had been interviewed that year, and she was selected to be an astronaut. So I had to go to work and be happy for her. Yay, me. <laughs> So for somebody who did not want to be an astronaut, the fire was lit, and I wanted to be an astronaut badly. So I went back, got a second advanced degree, went through the entire process again, and was selected the next round. So in August of 1996, I reported to the Johnson Space Center, along with my other astronaut candidates. We were wonderful. We were glad to be there. We were a family. There were 44 of us. It was the largest class ever selected, and trust me, NASA will never do that again. We were nicknamed the Sardines, and the class before you gets to nickname you, and some of the previous names were the, the hogs, the hairballs, and the slugs. So by all comparison, sardines was quite mild and quite fitting because there were so many of us. So for the next year and a half, my 43 siblings and I did everything together. We studied together, we traveled together, we ate together, we were a family. So you can imagine how excited I was when my family members started being assigned to flights and getting to fly in space, because that meant my turn was coming soon. Five years into my astronaut career, many of my family members had flown and or been assigned to a mission, and I had done neither starting to get a little bit despondent and worried that I'd never get my chance to, to fly in space. At that time, most of the missions were to continue to build the International Space Station, but there was one mission that was coming up that was purely a science mission where the astronauts were going to be the lab rats. So the scientists held meetings so we'd understand exactly what the experimentation was going to be like. I, held the, I went to those informational sessions and signed away any rights I had should something medically strange happen to me after the flight. I didn't really care. I just wanted to fly in space. So the day came and they were going to announce the crew. I waited with bated breath as they announced the commander, then the pilot, and then all the mission specialists. My name was not called. I had not been selected. Now, I've not really shared this with many people, but the mission that I wanted so badly to be a part of was STS-107, the last flight of Space Shuttle Columbia. On February 1st, 2003, just 16 minutes from landing after a very successful mission, the crew and the shuttle were lost. So had I been part of that mission, I wouldn't be standing here before you today. It was tragic, it was devastating, and it was even more so devastating to me because three of my family members were on board. Despite that tragedy, I still wanted to fly in space. And I was assigned to STS-116. And because of the accident, our flight was delayed three years. But on December 9th, 
2006, at 8 hours, 47 minutes, and 35 seconds precisely, <laughs> p.m. Eastern Standard Time, after having an unsuccessful attempt two nights earlier, STS-116 flew off the pad with the date for the International Space Station. Now, our mission was very critical, and it was quite complex. Not only were we taking up another piece of the hardware to continue building the space station, we, was, uh, we were also taking up thousands of pounds of equipment, and we had a massive rewiring job. So imagine, imagine powering down every single thing in your house, taking your house off of the city's power grid, rewiring it, putting it back on the power grid, and hope it comes back on. That's what we did to the International Space Station twice while flying 220 miles above the Earth. It would have been a really bad day on the job if the power had not come back on the International Space Station. For the first seven days of the mission, we were extremely busy. Everyone's timeline was jam-packed, and we didn't even have time to eat together. We ate to dinner. We ate on the fly, literally. But on the eighth day, we were actually given some free time, and I thought to myself, Good gracious, NASA, even God rested on the seventh day. <laughs> but on that eighth day, I flew over to the Russian segment to the service module, I plastered my face against the window, and I watched the world go by at 17,500 miles per hour, or five miles every second, or eight kilometers every second. As we were coming up over the East Coast, I saw something billowing up from the ground, smoke, and I immediately thought, there's some unrest. Somebody is bombing somebody else. And then it dawned on me. I looked inside the International Space Station. I said, look at us. We're a mini United Nations, a crew that consisted of two African-American astronauts, one astronaut of Korean and Jewish descent, a Scandinavian astronaut, an astronaut from the UK who became an American citizen so he could pursue his dream of becoming an astronaut, an astronaut of Indian descent, a German astronaut, a Spanish-American astronaut, and a Russian cosmonaut. And I thought, if the 10 of us can get along and work together for a common good aboard this tin can of a spaceship, why can't we all get along here on Earth where there's so much more space? Nelson Mandela once said, and I'm going to paraphrase, no person is born hating another person. People are taught to hate. And if they can teach them to hate, then we can teach everyone to love because love comes so much more naturally to the human heart. This person doesn't like this person. Why does there have to be conflict? Why can't he go this way and she go this way? We're all humans, and you know what? We're not all really that different, even though we subscribe to different religions and have different skin tones. We are all part of one race, the human race, and we need to work together collectively for the good of humanity. This journey, my journey, has been incredible, certainly unplanned, and absolutely life-changing. And I'm not just talking about the glamorous space flight. I'm talking about the entire process. From my unplanned landing at NASA, to interviewing to be an astronaut, to working with people from literally all parts of the world, to losing my astronaut family. But hands down, the most remarkable part of this journey is what I discovered, my newfound perspective on humanity. Because through this journey, I've discovered that there is always space for humanity. Thank you. <laughs>